But we're, we're uh, back in Nehemiah again this week. It's Nehemiah chapter 8. And we're gonna, we see that the wall has been rebuilt in 52 days. All to the glory of God and to the shock and chagrin of the enemies. But Nehemiah, he's not going to turn out the lights. The party's not over. He's not going to close up shop and go back to Persia just yet. A greater rebuilding project is about to take place. And there's what we're going to start studying about going forward. Bigger than the wall. Yep. A rebuilding of the people. A revival. A rebuilding of lives to the glory of God. That's what we're going to start seeing. Spiritual relationship with God, a revival from the Word of God. Revival, we need to be praying in our land and in our nation, in our hearts and in our churches to bring back revival from the Lord. So Nehemiah 8 through 10, it's the record of a great month-long revival that occurred in Jerusalem. The likes of this revival have never been seen before in that nation or will be seen again until the Messiah, Jesus Christ, returns in all his glory. And the key element in this revival was the return of the people to the word of God. It was a spirit-led movement back to the book. Back to the book they went. You may say, wait a minute, pastor. That's it? That's the key? I mean, there are thousands of books on revival, and you're telling me what is needed is that? Well, today we're going to see God has a much simpler way to revival than a 300-page commentary on how to get to revival. You know it? All spiritual revivals, everybody. And you can research this, whether it's one's individual life or whether it's in the church. They begin with a Holy Spirit-led movement. Back to the book. Back to the Word of God. Do you know that? The ancient yet living words of God. The ancient yet eternal words of God. Don't you love those two words in one sentence? Ancient yet eternal Word of God. The only book is always perfect. The Word of God never misses its mark and is always perfect. Perfect every time. Amen. This morning we are only going to uh, we're going to take a look at chapter eight where we see that people had one a thirst for the word of God. Two, they had a hunger for God's word, and they finally had a heart uh, that desired to obey God's word. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day that we could come and sing and worship you, that you love us, Lord. You love us so much, you sent us your love letter, which is your word. Lord, you love us so much, you want the best for us. You want to bless us. You want us to have a relationship with you. You want to fellowship and commune with us. You want us to follow you, and you want us to live in a way that pleases you. For Lord, you want to be loved by us willingly. Lord, I pray that we submit to the Holy Spirit in our lives, that we have a deep, deep hunger and thirst for your word, your ancient yet eternal love letter to us. In your name we pray, Jesus Christ. Amen. So now before we look at the movement back to the book in chapter 8, I want to let you know, if any of you are wondering, We're not skipping chapter 7, but we're going to come back to it with a greater theme when we arrive to chapter 10. So we didn't just forget old chapter 7. We will come back and then we're going to take a look at the movement of God's people back to the promised land, which is recorded in chapter 7. So I want you in the upcoming weeks be reading chapter 7. It's a very exciting read. When you do, at first glance, you might say, and maybe second glance, you might say. And maybe third glance, you might say, this looks like some mighty boring reading. It's like reading a phone book where the plot is rather thin. <laughs> but to race over this is to miss a very, very precious truth from the Lord, 
a very precious truth indeed. So we're going to come back to it and see a blessed truth and an encouragement for us all in the upcoming weeks, okay? But let's now look at chapter 8 and the beginning of this great, great revival. And the first element in the back to the book movement was that people had a thirst for God's word. Let's read Nehemiah 7, 73 through 8, 2. You can turn there or follow along on the screen. The priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the musicians, and the temple servants, along with certain of the people and the rest of the Israelites, settled in their own towns. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people came together as one, and ASV, one man, in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. So Nehemiah 6.15 tells us that the wall was completed on the 25th day of the sixth month of Elu, okay? It is now the first day of the seventh month, Tishri. This is September through October, so it's right now. It's right now in September. There are 29 days in the sixth month, to, uh, so five days have passed since the walls have been completed. And on the first day of the seventh month, all of Israel, as commanded by God, and that goes back to Leviticus 23, 23 through 25, was to gather together in Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Trumpets. It was one of these three festivals to take place in this month, this time frame. The other two were being the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Booths, or Tabernacles. So the people, 50,000 plus or more, plus means or more, right? 50,000 plus people began to gather in Jerusalem and come together from the outlying cities before the newly constructed wall of Jerusalem, when something amazing happened. All the people who gathered as one man, uh, verse 1, told, or the NASV, asked Ezra for the book of the law of Moses to be brought out. You may say, that's amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. Not just some of the people, but all of the people. Not only all the men, but all the women and all who were old enough to understand. God wanted us to know it was all. In Nehemiah 8.1, and all the people gathered. All the people were attentive. Three. In the sight of all the people. Five. Above all the people. Five. All the people stood up. Five. All the people answered. In verse 6. Who was there? All the people. How could this happen? I believe that just as God moved in the king of, uh, in the heart of King Artaxerxes to let Nehemiah go rebuild the wall, and that was back in chapter two, and just as He moved in the mind of Nehemiah in two twelve and the heart of Nehemiah in uh, seven five, He was now moving in the hearts of the people to thirst for God's word and ask for the book. You see. This, the book of the law of Moses in verse 1 was the Pentateuch. It's the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Remember those five? You know, those ones we spend all so much time in. It is the book which the Lord had, what did it say? Verse 1, commanded for Israel or had given Israel. Here once again, who commanded the books? Who gave it to Israel? Again, the Bible is amazing as we see a truth. That man may have written the book with their hand, but the author of the book is God. You you know that? When you have that in your hand, that comes straight from the Lord. He is the author, not only the first five books of the Bible, but all the 66 books, ending with the last book, Revelation. Listen to 2 Peter 1. 20 through 21. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. 
For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. God gave his men through, gave his word through men, but mere men are not the authors. God is. So what you hold in your hands is the very breath of God. Praise God. It's the very words of the Lord to you. You want to hear an interesting fact about the book of Nehemiah? Do you? If not, I'm just going to stand here and sweat on my full head of hair. You know, that's a, I remember I tell that joke all the time. Someone says, man, you, you've changed a lot since high school. I said, yeah, but I haven't changed my hair. Dude. I still part my hair down the middle. <laughs> Here's an interesting fact about Nehemiah. It is a book full of power, courage, strength, trust, faith, grief, temptation, victory, revival, enemies, fortitude, big ideas and big results, victory won, the impossible done, the evil on the run because of a big, big God. That's the book of Nehemiah. But you want to know what's cool about that? There are no recorded miracles in Nehemiah as one thinks of miracles. Nope. Not such as we saw in Joshua and in our study of the miracles of Jesus and John recorded in the Gospel of John. No miracle like you see in Exodus or Acts. And I love this because the book of Nehemiah is you. The book of Nehemiah is me. God's word covers everybody in all times. We live in a dispensation where we see no physical miracles with man as God's instruments as uh, physical miracles today are done by God. Amen? But you know what? Really cool. John the Baptist, remember him? He was described this way by Jesus himself with these words from the Lord. Listen to how Jesus describes John the Baptist in Matthew 11, 11. He says, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Wow, what an amazing statement from the Son of God about a person. Can you imagine if Jesus said that about you? But like you, like Nehemiah, John the Baptist never performed a miracle. Did you know that? Yet yeah, that's what Jesus had to say to him. Yet the key to Nehemiah was this. He spoke the truth and that everything in John the Baptist said about Jesus was true. They served God in truth, okay? Let the word of God today do the miracle working in your life. Because it is the word of God through the Holy Spirit that changes hearts, and that is truly the greatest miracle of all. If you're sitting here today with the changed hearts through the Holy Spirit and His Word on you, do you know that? But you know what? When 50,000 plus people in Nehemiah, as one man, start thinking and start thirsting and asking to hear what God has to say to them in His Word, there is a Nehemiah heart miracle. You with me? 50,000 all at once. You know, this book is full of heart miracles, and one of the most amazing was this one, where God is beginning to move, creating a hunger for His Word. So, let's look. What caused it? What's one of the things? Why did they ask for the book? They asked for the book because they knew perfectly well why their walls had been broken, why their gates had been burned down, why they had been delivered into Babylonian captivity by God in the first place. In Ezra's prayer in chapter 9, and by the way, that prayer is the longest, largest prayer in the Bible, he puts his finger on the source of the troubles and sorrows that they had experienced. Nehemiah, Nehemiah 9, 29-30. He says, You warned them in order to turn them back to your law, but they became arrogant and disobeyed your commands. They sinned against your ordinances, of which you said the person who obeys them will live by them. Stubbornly they turned their backs on you, became stiff-necked, and refused to listen. For many years you were patient with them, praise God, 
By your spirit you warned them through your prophets, yet they paid no attention, so you gave them into the hands of the neighboring people. You see, sadly, in verse 29, they refused to listen. That's a willful intent statement. It's not by accident. And they paid no attention, in verse 30, to the word of God. Listen to the words of Jeremiah of the same people, 7, 24 through 28. He said, but they did not listen or pay attention. Now, here's Jeremiah. Instead, they followed the stubborn inclinations of their evil hearts. They went backward, not forward. From the time your ancestors left Egypt until now, day after day, and again and again, I sent you my servants, the prophets. But they did not listen to me or pay attention. They were stiff-necked and did more evil than their ancestors. When you tell them all of this, they will not listen to you. When you call to them, they will not answer. Therefore, say this to them. This is the nation that has not obeyed the Lord, its God, or responded to correction. For what? We talked about this last week. Truth has perished. It has vanished from their lips. Wow. Here in Jeremiah, we read the same thing, that because they did not listen or pay attention to God's word, truth perished. It vanished from the lips of the people. If you want to start seeing truth leave people, just take the Bible out of their life. Isaiah 59, 14 through 15 went on and added, truth didn't only perish, truth stumbled in the streets. And it finally became nowhere to be found. We saw this last week about what happens when you compromise with truth in your life. Remember Nehemiah's, I cannot compromise truth and I will not sin against my Lord, right? However, these people, having seen the grace of God in sending Ezra and Nehemiah to them, and seeing the miraculous rebuilding of the long destroyed wall, in spite of their enemies, in spite of all their opposition, They did not want to make the same mistake again of not listening and not paying attention to God's Word. And they called for the book. You know, when an individual, when a church or a nation will not listen or pay attention to the Word of God, it has no reliable truth to live by. It has no absolutes to stand on. And truth will perish in the streets. Do you know that? Bring out the book, they cried. Bring out the book. I want to tell you, I've seen it in my own life in years gone by. If your life is shallow, if your life is, if your life is broken and uneasy, where do you re- uh, start to rebuild your life? To turn things around in your life. Where does revival get its start in your heart? You start with this book, with the truth, with the Word of God Himself. This is the only place in all this world where you can find pure, absolute, unalloyed truth to guide you through this life and keep you on the path of life eternal. Do you believe this? All your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. Psalm 119, 160. So bring out the book. Bring out the ancient eternal word. Lord, I want it. I thirst for it. We must be back to saying that. But sadly, let's go back and look at a sadie. Look at Jeremiah 18, 12 through 15. Do you like that word, girls? I just made that up. But they will reply. It's no use. We will continue with our own plans. No, don't do that. Please. Don't do that. We will all follow the stubbornness of our evil hearts. Yet my people have forgotten me. They burn incense to worthless idols which made them stumble in their ways in the ancient paths. They made them walk in byways on roads not built up. Here we see the people described before God's judgment fell on them as those who would not listen to God but stubbornly wanted to continue in their way, to live their lives according to their own plans. Have there ever been you? Uh, yeah, me. 
and in living according to their own plans. What happened? They stumbled from the ancient paths and they started walking in bypaths and they weren't on the highway. And in living according to their own plans, God's judgment fell. But you know what? God pled with them. Look at Jeremiah 6.16. Listen to God. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient past. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. Do you hear the heart of God? It was God who sent His Son and God who gave His Word. Of course, he, He's pleading with us. That is the wrong I will not, by the way. I will not compromise. Let's not our I will not be I will not walk in. Right? God pleaded with them to ask for the ancient paths back. To ask where the good way is. And to walk in it. And he promised them, you will find rest. You will find rest. You see, the good way, the path to soul rest, is found here in the book of God. We wander from the ancient path. We wander from the path God has given to us in his word. To walk on all the bypaths and not the highway. To live according to our plans and not according to his plan. Do you know how many people are on that highway? Do you know how few take that exit? How many that say, no, I'm going to live according to my plan. No, I'm not going to listen to you. I'll get to you later. How many have been on the highway and, and you're actually traveling? You, go, I'll get it. I, I, you know you need gas, but you just push on to the next exit. They say... I got another exit that's going to tell me God's exit. What's going to happen when that happens? Life will be full of unnecessary troubles and trials in your life. It will be full of unnecessary hardships and unnecessary heartaches. It will definitely be full of unnecessary, all, all of this is unnecessary, sin and sorrow. We will forfeit blessings that God wants to give to us, and we will invite the chastening hand of God. I don't know about you, but that's a bad invite. And the answer is to go back, back to the ancient path, back to the book of the Lord if we are ever to go forward. You see, God's way is the only way, right? But hey, notice something here. Notice in Nehemiah that they did not ask for some new manifesto, did they? They did not ask for some new form of thinking, some new teaching from Ezra, some new revelation or some new insight. They just said, bring out the book. There's truth there. You can find all these hidden nuggets in God's Word if you just meditate on it. We don't need today any new revelation from God. We don't need any new insight to walk right. Just haul out the ancient eternal words of God Dust it off and pour into it. And you're going to say, wow, this is still just as relevant today. You know, hey, when you buy a car, it comes with a manual. The designer and the maker of the car knows the car better than you do. And so the manual comes with it on its care and for its maintenance. A manual explaining how things work and their intended purpose. So God is your creator and maker, and the Bible is his book of instructions for us. When all else fails, read the manual. But I got to thinking about that line. I was going to scratch that line because I felt it could be a bad line. But I left it there because I wanted to say, but before all else fails, read it. You're going to run better. You're going to do better. Don't get to the point where all else fails. But if you're at all else fails... You have a place to go. Right? Nehemiah 9.33 said Israel had acted wrongly or wickedly in the past. But I tell you, they never acted more wisely than on this day when they asked for God's word. 
And I'm telling you, you will never make a wiser decision in your life than to say, I am not only going to stay in the book, I'm never going to have to get to a point where I have to go back to the book. And if I'm not in the book now, I am going back to bring order that God wants in my life because it's God's plan, not my plan. And that's what's best for me. Right on. So we see a thirst for God's word. The second element in this book, this movement back to the book, is a hunger to know God's word. Let's look at Nehemiah 8, 3. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. And these 13 men started teaching the law. A wooden platform. Here you go. The first pulpit of sorts. It was big enough. It was a big old uh, platform. It carried these 13 men. What's it say? That Ezra read the book from when? From daybreak till noon, about five hours. And all the people listened attentively. Hmm. What's this say? Oh. Oops. I guess I'm wrong. Tell me there's no miracles in Nehemiah. <laughs> the words listened attentively is the Hebrew word for ear. They were all ears. They had their ears on, CB language. Hey, you got your ears on. They had their ears on. Seriously, what held their attention? I know. I, I, I thought, what held their attention for five hours? All day. What, what? It had to be because Ezra had a light show, big multimedia presentation, and I know he had a PowerPoint. Because without a PowerPoint, multimedia... <laughs> And you know, whoa, all of it. I, I'm not saying if you want to praise the Lord, praise Him, serve Him, worship Him. But we know that's what Ezra had, right? That's what people are like. Yeah. Perhaps the 13 men on the platform were doing a drama. Maybe they were doing a skit. Perhaps they were doing interpretive dance. Nope. According to Malachi 2, 6 through 9, listen to this. The Levite, as the teacher of the law, he was to do something. He was to give true instruction to preserve knowledge, that is, the knowledge of God, and his truth as the messenger of the Lord Almighty. He was to preach and teach God's truth, not his opinions, and the people were to seek instruction. So each person had a role. The current trend in many pulpits today is to minimize teaching and maximize feeling to just share instead of proclaim. To whip up emotion apart from instruction is not honoring to God because, listen, worship light and Bible light are not right by God. I want to worship strong and be Bible strong. I don't want one lacking from the other. Do you? Do you? So we make no apologies here for teaching and, pre and preaching the Word of God. You know, it is where the real joy comes from. And it is the Lord's words which are needed. Not man's philosophies blanketed with Scripture as icing. All that held their attention was their own heart's desire to hear God's Word. They were not just hearing with their ears, but with the ears of their heart and their mind. Do you all have ears on your heart? Better hearing begins there. Huh. They had a hunger for the Word of God. For the bread of life. And they could not get enough of it. Give me it. I can't get enough. Where is that hunger to hear God's word today? You know, God's diet is 
full of rich calories. It's the perfect food for the healthy spiritual life. It's what supplies your life with energy, giving you fuel for the rigors of service. Do you know that? Could it be today in Christendom, perhaps that we are so filled with the husks of this world that we have little appetite for the bread of heaven? What you chomping on? Did you know that according to many studies, 85% of professing Christians have never read the entire Bible? Pew Research Study shows that only 35% read the New Testament, have read the New Testament, and only 20% have read the Old Testament because they skip over chapters like Nehemiah 7. That's a shocking revelation. And when you step back and you look at many professing born-again believers, it's really not that shocking after all. However, I did that PowerPoint on purpose. It's black and white. But let's add a little color to our life. Did you know if you read the Bible one hour a day, you could read the Bible through in three months? And if you're a slow reader, that's fine, four. And if you can't read very well, there's audio books. If you read the Bible just 15 minutes a day, you can read the Bible through in one year. Yet it seems 85% of Christians cannot find 15 minutes a day to hear from God. But once again, I thought, that's not a good line. That's because that's a lie from Satan. I thought. Is that even an accurate statement? Or maybe more accurately, it's because they don't have a heart to give God 15 minutes of what they really have in the day. I think that's probably more accurate. And the next question, when believers attend church, is there a kind of attentive attitude that we see here in Nehemiah? Pastors and teachers can write books on what they see and preach when they teach God's Word. You know, I'm not even going to get to end it. I have it right here. But I don't believe the Holy Spirit's laying that on me. I don't need to sit here and punk on you on what I see out there. I just want to give a good old gut check. Everybody ever been to football? You women have, but let me tell you, sometimes you just need a gut check when you get the wind. (laughs) You know, we just need a gut check. You know? The word was not just read to them. It was also explained to them. Nehemiah 7 and 8, the 13 men on the platform would apparently and successfully from the law of Moses stop and then explain. Verse 7 says, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. That's very important. They read and studied, what does it say, verse 18? From the first day to the last day. On the 24th day, in chapter 9, 1 and 3, they read from the book a quarter of the day. Again, was the pattern explaining and instructing. Can you imagine at this point what Satan and his and the enemies was thinking after they tried so much to destroy these people? And now this? So you see, this was more than just passive hearing. They were serious about learning the Word of God. This was an extensive teaching program. It was intensive. Pretty cool. Once every seven years, the law was broken out. Man, I'm done wearing suits up here. <laughs> We're either going to get some AC up here or something's going to change. Whew. Or, you know. <laughs> but listen, Deuteronomy 31, 11, 12, listen to this. When all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men and women and little ones. Hey, wow, little ones. And the stranger who is within your gates, that they may hear, that they may learn to fear the Lord your God and carefully observe all the words of the law. There's the equation. God wants his people and us today to hear, learn, and obey. It was same then. It's the same today. Hear, learn, obey the word. If you're not obeying it, you didn't hear it, 
or you didn't learn anything. And if you did not hear it and you did not learn, then you're not going to have you're going to have a hard time obeying it. It all comes together. That word learn is translated elsewhere to be an expert in, skilled in, trained in. God wants his people to be people of the book, skilled, even experts in the book. And I'm not talking about knowing all the Sunday school stories or childhood stories, but a deep study of the learning of God's word. You can have all the degrees in the world. You really can. You can have all the degrees in the world that help you make a living. But if you are not raised up learning, studying, and are ignorant of God's Word, you will be poverty-stricken when it comes to living. Living in a way that's pleasing to God, that is. Living in a way that brings rest to your soul that God wants to give to you, that is. Living that has purpose and makes a difference in time today and in eternity. Isn't that amazing? That's what God wants to do. In our Wednesday night previous series on the fruit of the Holy Spirit, my dad gave this quote and I wrote it down so I could use it because it's so important. The Word of God is the language in which the Holy Spirit speaks to you. You know, what kind of day do we live in? We live in a day of scientific wonders. We can put men on the moon or we can stage things to look like it I thought I was teasing. I'm kidding. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Too much. We can put men on the moon. We can design gadgets that do astonishing things. We can build structures today that make ancient wonders look like Lego sets. But we can't hold our marriages together. We build amazing computers, but we don't know how to build character. We know how to harness light and airways, but we don't know how to control ourselves and harness our sin natures and yield to the Holy Spirit. That's what it's all about. We have no power in ourselves. Listen to 1 John 2.17. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. This is followed up by Listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew 5.18. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, nor the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. We are so knowledgeable in a world that is passing away, First John 2, and often we are too ignorant of the word that will never pass away. Let's reverse that. In our lives, in the church today. You know, listen to me. I don't want to offend you. I'm not trying to make a blanketed statement on all who attend ECGBC or our brothers and sisters elsewhere in other churches today. But I believe this old adage if the shoe fits, wear it. And many a believer today, the shoe fits. It, get rid of it if it fits. Let's be people of the book, the ancient and eternal Word of God. You see, I want you to know something. My burden isn't to admonish you. It isn't filled with anger flowing from a letter of the law, legalistic attitude. That's from Satan. My burden is from a love for the Lord, a hatred of Satan and his destructive influence over those I love. You see, the true burden is... I know nothing will benefit you more than flat out loving the Word of God and the benefits and results flowing from God Himself for that type of Bible love in your life. And I want that for you. And I want that for me. And God pleaded for it before I'm even pleading for it now. You see, I know that the Word's going to make you wise. I know it's going to restore your soul. I know it's going to bring rejoicing to your heart. It's going to keep you pure. And it's going to protect your life. We read that this morning in Psalm 19, 7 through 11. When I was a boy at Bethesda. Kayla, that's your cue. When I was a boy at Bethesda. 
in elementary school, <laughs> we learned this song. I can sing it to this day because it was, I sang it. And we sang it all the time. And it's in my heart. It impacted me later in adulthood. Listen to the words the way I learned it as a boy in Psalm 19, 7 through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Wow. You know, that God might give us this hunger to know that description of God's Word. To love it and long for it as David, the man after God's own heart, did. How our lives would change and the church would be transformed to sing His Word in our hearts and minds. To allow God's Word to flow out of us that we love it so much it just comes out in song. It's kind of like the shower experience when you all become Grammy nominees. Everyone sings good in the shower. When you're by yourself, sing! Let the... Let the Word of God sing from your life. He says it's more precious than gold. Not just gold, but pure gold. It is sweeter than honey. Not just normal honey, but the honey that comes straight from the comb. The Lord says, I warn you. My Word is perfect, He said. My Word is right. It's radiant. It's pure. It's eternal. It's firm. It's righteous. It is trustworthy, it's wise, it's simple and precious. So I, the Lord, warn you, keeping them comes a great reward. So I'm not here to admonish. I'm here to plead, to get back to the Word of God, because I know that it will do this for your life and for my life. This is the burden in which we share today. Look at the result, though, Nehemiah 8, 9 through 11. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and the teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people, saying, be still, for this day is holy. Do not grieve. They began to weep, and they heard the words of the law. Why? Because the word brought conviction of sin. They saw how good God had been to them, and yet how wickedly they had acted in return, and how miserably they had suffered for it. And justly so, because of it. Oh, the time wasted. The opportunities lost. The blessings forfeited because of their stubbornness and their disobedience. Okay, okay, we get it. And so they wept and they grieved, and rightfully so. Real repentance should bring about grief. But Nehemiah and Ezra said this to them. Stop grieving. Stop weeping. Eat. Rejoice. Share. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Verse 10. Amen? Are you all attentive? 
The joy of the Lord is your strength. You see, under the words convicting power in our lives, they were driven to repentance. But that repentance was not to degenerate into a self-absorbed remorse. But rather issue in a great joy of the Lord's forgiveness and His mercy and His grace. They were to rejoice in the understanding they now had of the Word of God so they could move forward in obedience to the Word of God. Rather than to sob and weep over how they disobeyed and to sob and weep how they failed in the past and what they've lost. You see, God wanted them to do something. He wanted them to be more aware of His strength than their weaknesses. To be more filled with the joy that He brings than linger on their failures and their sins. Do you see that? Some believers never get over their sins and never get over their failures. There is definitely, everybody, a time for weeping. There is definitely a time for grieving over sin. But after repentance, after forgiveness, after reconciliation with the Lord take, takes place in your life, then apply the ancient words of God and move on with Him in joy. Live for Him in joy. They weep and feel guilt today. Even though they say they believe. God had forgiven them. I hear that a lot. Sometimes muttering that, I know God has forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. You know, that's a misapplication of Scripture. And then they do not go on in the strength of God's forgiveness and the joy that comes from that. Remember, everybody, Psalm 32, 1. Blessed is the ones whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Whose sins are covered? Whose sins are forgiven with real, true heart, repentance, and a turning back to the Lord? Everyone's. How happy. Remember, when the prodigal son, when he came to his senses and realized his sin and repentance, he headed back home. What did the father do? What did he find? He found a father waiting and longing for him to come home. There was a celebration. There was not condemnation. Here in Nehemiah 8 9, it says this day, is sacred. It is holy. You see, everybody, it is a holy day when anyone goes back to God's Word to humbly let it speak to them, to seek to understand it and let it do its, and let the Word do its work of conviction. A conviction that leads to repentance in your life and then to forgiveness and then correction and such holiness or separation unto God leads to true, abundant living and joyfulness. Do you know this? So we see a thirst for God's Word, a hunger for God's Word, and we're going to close shortly. It's not too much longer. A third, a heart to obey God's Word. Nehemiah 8.14 They found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month. In their study of God's Word, they what found written in the law. How the Lord commanded them to live in booths for seven days during the seventh month beginning on the 15th day. They were obviously reading and studying Leviticus 23-34. Where Israel was commanded there to live in booths or huts made of foliage as a memorial of God's gracious provision for them when he brought them up out of Egypt and through the wilderness. Leviticus 23.43 says, So your descendants, why did he want them to do this? Well, know that I had the Israelites live in temporary shelters when I brought them out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. These were ordinances or symbolic reminders of God's grace and work in delivering them in previous generations. We are told in verse 17, however, that this had not been practiced in Israel since the days of Joshua 1,000 years ago. Look at Nehemiah 8.17. The whole company that had returned from ex exile built temporary shelters and lived in them. From the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day. Follow me. From the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated it like this, and their joy was very great. From a 1,000 years ago? Does that contradict Ezra 3.4? Listen to Ezra 3.4. Then in accordance with what is written, 
They celebrated the festival of tabernacles or booths with the required number of burnt offerings prescribed on that day. Here we read they celebrated the Feast of Booths just 13 years earlier at the rededication of the temple. And Nehemiah says it's been a thousand years. Hmm. Also, listen to this. 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 8, 2 Chronicles 8, 13 says that Solomon celebrated this feast at the dedication of the original temple. So how could it be said it was not celebrated since Joshua's day a thousand years earlier up to this day? Hmm. Some say it means that it had never been celebrated with joy on this day. Is that true? 2 Chronicles 7 9 says the people, when they celebrated it, were rejoicing with happiness of heart. So that can't be it. Some say it means that it was observed, but not by the whole assembly. Nehemiah, like here in Nehemiah 8 17. Or the entire assembly as on this day. So maybe that's the difference. But that's not true either, because Ezra 3 1 says they all gathered together as one man. 13 years earlier. To celebrate it just like here in Nehemiah 8.1, all gathered as one man. So what's the answer? Look at verse 17. Like this. Two little words. Hadn't been celebrated like this. The Bible gives some very keen sight into the Lord here. What God commands, God expects right down to every very detail. While the Feast of Tabernacle was kept by Solomon and Ezra, it was not kept exactly as God had commanded it to be done. Solomon says nothing of building booths or living in them. Ezra said they kept the prescribed daily sacrifices outlined in Numbers 29, but no mention of living in the huts. That of going through the symbolism exactly the way the Lord had commanded them to go through it. You see, the camping out element may have lapsed here. But looking carefully at what God said to do, they did exactly what God commanded them here. And they made huts and they lived in them for seven days here in this revival. And that is what has not been done since the day it was given. Does God care that his word is followed exactly the way he commands it to be followed? In Nehemiah 8.15 it says, And that they should announce and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go out into the mountain and bring out olive branches, branches of oil trees, myrtle branches, palm branches, and branches of leafy trees to make booths as it is written. Write down to what material, material was acceptable for the booth as it is written. Catch this scene in Nehemiah 8.16. So the people went out and brought back branches and built themselves temporary shelters on their own roofs, in their courtyards, in the courts of the house of God, and in the square by the water gate and the one by the gate of Ephraim. Here they are. Here are people with perfectly good homes to live in, moving out and living in these huts, not made of uh, tent material, but branches and palms, some right on their rooftops for seven days. Inconvenient? Yes. But was it obedient? They may have argued that David didn't do it or Solomon didn't do it, but should what others do or do not do make a difference to us? So when they read what was written, they went out and they did it right away. Isn't that the attitude God loves in the heart of a believer? If it is written, I am doing it. If it is commanded by my Lord, I am doing it. If I did not know that before now, but I see it written, I am doing it. If thousands of years have not done, uh, have not done it for a thousand years, that makes no difference. If I see it written, I am doing it. Compromise truth, I cannot. Sin, I will not. The word, I will do. That's the heart God wants from us. It is not for us to decide what we will do or not do but simply to discover for ourselves through God's word what God wants and commands and just do it. No matter how trivial it seems to us or how difficult, just do it. 
You see, God coined that phrase way before Nike ever did. Satan, he just tries to pervert. You see, it is one thing to hear and study the Word and quite another to do it, right? Let's be doers of the Word, like it says in James 1.22, where it says, do not merely listen to the words and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says, just do it. So, Nehemiah 8.17, what happened? There was great rejoicing. You know, there is a joy that comes when you put the Lord and His Word first in your life. A deep, deep joy and a peace that He gives to those who obey Him, who fellowship with Him, who submit to Him, who follow His Word, who loves what He says. Psalm 28, 1, 2 says, Blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in obedience to Him. You will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. How blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in His ways. You will be happy, and you will make an impact as a wall builder for God. What is it you know from God's Word in your life that you should do? What is it you should, that you know from God's Word in your life you are not doing? I encourage you, hesitate no longer. If it is written, just do it. And wait for the joy. Do you know if you're not following God's word, I don't care what you say, you don't have joy. So three elements in this book of the movement back to the book that led to revival are one, thirst for God's word. Be thirsty for the word of God. Two, hunger for the word of God in your life. And ask the Holy Spirit to lay upon you a desire, a heart desire to obey God's word. This week, I ask you all, let's go back to the ancient paths. Let's go back to the book of the Bible. The book. God's book. Not books about the book, but the book. Okay, I just want to get that. Not books about the book, but let's get back to the book. I want to challenge you every day this week till we meet next Sunday. I want to challenge you to spend just 15 minutes a day in God's Word. If you're doing that, great. That means adding 15 minutes. <laughs> no. You get my point. If you're not in the Lord's Word, please get into it 15 minutes a day. If you're there, get deeper. I want you to take that challenge because God wants you to take that minimum challenge. Every day this week till we meet next Sunday, Let's get out of the 85% if you're there of Christians who can't find 15 minutes to be alone with their Lord. Let's come with hearts hungry to know and ready to uh, uh, obey and submit. You know, all revival comes from the Holy Spirit. And it all comes with a desire from the ancient words of God, from the ancient of days, our Lord. You see, guys, this is the greatest love letter ever written. And from it flows the blessings of heaven from the author of the letter. Dine in. Dive in. Consume all you can and eat. And keep coming back for more to God's Word.